Jerry Koch Gonzalez. I live in Pioneer Valley co-housing community in Amherst, Massachusetts. That's our, that's not quite what we look like yet, but in a few days, we'll probably look like that. It's, it's getting there. Uh, so that I say Amherst, Massachusetts, US. I've been living here for 26 years since it was founded. And uh, we were operated by consensus for the first uh, 18 or so years and have been sociocratic for the last number since then. And uh, my background is um, I've been a social change agent all my life. Um, val always have valued egalitarianism. Uh, and, and so teaching consensus was something that I used to do. Uh, it worked for me uh, when I was in a social change group that had a high degree of shared values and high degree of shared skills. Um, but then I found when I moved into co-housing that it didn't quite work as well. <laughs> and so when I found sociocracy, uh, I got excited. So I do now teach sociocracy, which is sometimes called dynamic governance, uh, because that's an easier phrase for some people to take in and something that sounds perhaps like socialism or some kind of ocracy. And I also teach nonviolent communication. And I love the two things kind of together. I believe that we really need, you know, really good governance, and then we need good communication skills to go along with that. Um, so why do groups use whole, why use whole group consensus, which is what the tradition in, in co-housing communities is that, you know, you start coming together, you form your group, and historically, almost all the co-housing communities in the United States and Canada were operating, socio were operating uh, by consensus. I mean, in the, whole, the whole group would get together and you'd take a lot of those decisions in the whole group. Sometimes you'd farm out some things to various committees, uh, and then often they would come back to the whole group with their proposals. So why use it? Well, because every voice counts the same. Um, and you really have the whole group then has full control over all decisions. In a sense, that's the ideal. The ideal of consensus is full equality. Um, and the reality is that it doesn't always quite work that way. So it really works best, as I said earlier, from my own personal experience in small homogeneous groups, similar values, similar skills, um, similar experiences. And it is really hard to be inclusive of all voices in a large group. Uh, you know, whenever you have those meetings with the 30 or 40 people in the room, uh, in any one meeting, only half of those people maybe will talk. And of that half that talks, maybe five of them will talk 10 times. Uh, so it is, it is not really an egalitarian process in hearing all the voices. And what happens in large group is, the, um, is that sense of um, anonymity, in a sense, that you are talking to the group which means one person speaks and then the next person just debates what the first person said. And it's really more a, a round robin of debate rather than the really listening and building on each other's ideas, typically. Um, so it tends winds up, part of the impact of that is consensus in whole group winds up being frustrating, slow, and biased towards dissatisfied individuals. When I look at sociocracy, I'm really trying to figure out what's the balance between the power of the individual and the power of the group. What both? <laughs> and the way consensus often is done is it actually winds up giving more power to the individual who two or three people out of the group of 50 who block the decisions and tend to block decisions over and over again. Um, I totally believe that every voice should be listened to, including that one or two people. Um, but when you don't have a way to hold a dialogue, um, they wind up having the power you know, without, without the context of a group being able to engage. And that said, I want to recognize that consensus is practiced in many different ways, and there's some absolutely fabulous consensus uh, facilitators out there uh, who, who, run, uh, an org who run a meeting in such a way that it's, it's to me, it's, oh, it's very close to sociocracy because they do it so well. So, um, so whole group consensus, decisions with everyone, general meeting or the whole community meeting for decisions, decisions by consensus. So what is sociocracy like? Well, it's decision in small linked circles. 
Uh, ideally, it's that, you know, five to seven people kind of numbers where you can really have a discussion and go around, have a couple of rounds when you're exploring things together. Um, the purpose of the general meeting, the full community meeting, is now more about connection rather than uh, decision making. And decision making is, of course, by consent. Um, and I should actually, I didn't ask how many, how much you all know about sociocracy, but I'm assuming if you come here, you know a little bit because you got attracted to this topic. So we have a, um, you know, we start off with a typical, here's a typical kind of organizational design. We've got a, the gray, the big gray circle is the whole community. Uh, and we've got a few committees that are working within that. Maybe there's a few committees that may be kind of on the side or kind of semi-autonomous, have, have some degree of autonomy. Um, but a lot of the times they're bringing decisions back to, to the whole group. And so the shift is taking the, um, taking that, that whole community and blowing it out. <laughs> so yes, it includes the whole community. That's the big circle that you see here, but we create this general circle that links the core working groups of the community. And they are linked with, you can see the two dots that kind of overlap both circles, the leader and delegates, as we call them, of each of the working groups. And there might be some people who are not in exactly in one of those groups, but do roles or tasks for the community. And the community uh, can just grow. Uh, you know, more, more circles can get butted out as you have needs. So how sociocracy operates? You have these working circles. Um, they have a clear defined membership and they make decisions about particular content or domain of, of that particular circle. And you have the general circle, which is the leaders and delegates of the core working circles. And one of their functions is to decide who decides. Uh, to say, okay, here's a new topic. What do we do with this one? Okay, let's send this new topic to that work circle. So they decide who decides, where, how to distribute the decision-making according to the, the different working circles that you have. The full circle, which ideally still meets because you're here in order to be in community, uh, all the members only makes some decisions and they're focused on learning, feedback and connection. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Not many, many co-housing communities don't have a, a mission circle or their board of directors. Um, co-housing communities often have a, a board of directors that is only made up of people within the, within the community. Uh, like homeowners. Um, and what we always wish for in sociocracy is that board of directors or what we prefer to call mission circle that includes some outside folks who kind of bring in the fresh air, different ideas into your community. Ourselves in my community, we do not have a mission circle with outside members, but I wish we did. And if we did, I wish we had somebody from we have three other co-housing communities within a couple of miles of us. It would be lovely to have one of those people from one of those communities sit on our mission circle so we could have more of exchange of what, how they're doing things, how are we doing things. It'd be lovely to have somebody who's a permaculture expert who can help us think about what we do with our land. Uh, so you can think about who, uh, who these outside influences could be uh, that would enrich the community. And there's always a fear, oh, we don't want to have outsiders because they would control things. Well, we're making decisions by consent. So no outsider can control anything. Um, here is Pioneer Valley co-housing community. This is our, our basic uh, organizational structure. So we have four core working circles. The common house manages uh, the use uh, and the care of the, of the common house building. Uh, plants, animal landscapes, or PALS for short, they take care of those things. Uh, so all that territory that we have, we've got 23 acres. Buildings and grounds takes care of the, 
the, we're a condominium, so Buildings and Grounds takes care of the roofing and the siding of our houses. They take care of our roads, parking lots, um, of our wood, sh our wood shop, of the heavy equipment like the tractor or the truck or the, you know, the boiler system in the common house, you know, some of those kinds of things. And then community life, which is the one I sit on, takes care of in a sense of all the people related things. Uh, care and counsel, conflict resolution, finances, our membership circle, uh, hub, which is about organizing the work. And then the leaders and delegates of our four circles all come together in the coordinating circle. And they talk about how the whole community is doing, because that's the place where the information about the whole is held. Those eight people plus one more who coordinates the coordinating circle, um, they have the information about the whole and they one of their roles also is to uh, is to uh, allocate um, to to plan the full circle meetings based upon the requests of the working circles. And so we have so, so the big the big blue line all around everything is the uh, that's the full circle. And what do we do with the full circle? limited decision-making. We literally only make about two decisions a year. Uh, one is the budget, uh, which we do every February. We, we basically affirm the budget that's been prepared by the finance circle based upon the, uh, the, the budgets that each of the working circles has created for themselves. Uh, we've been around long enough that we don't have to argue much about our budget. Um, but if there are new topics, then those, are, those, are, those tend to attract more attention. Those of you who are more informing communities, you'll have a lot more work to do about your budgets because there's so much possible variation um, and opinions about that. But once you're settled, the budget starts becoming more routine. Um, and we also elect or select or affirm our board of directors. Um, we're in transition about that now, possibly, but I'll just say this, our board of directors hasn't really functionally met in 26 years. You know, they are there on paper, they can rubber stamp the decisions that have been made so that we fulfill the letter of the law, um, but they have, they don't, they don't meet, they don't have any particular authority to do anything other than sign documents. Um, the, all the coordination happens in the coordinating circle and even sometimes the coordinating circle is not clear what to do because if the working circles are being very effective, they don't necessarily have much to do except to say, great, 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 great. Of course, in these times uh, with COVID around, there's, there's work to be done. Um, so. so what does the full circle do if it's not making decisions? So a key part is giving feedback, giving feedback to the different work circles who are coming up with proposals that they want, you know, they want to hear more from other people in the community. So community life might bring to the, to the full circle um, a proposal coming from our sub-circle of membership that we want to revise some of our membership ideas. How do we think about associate members and renter associates and uh, lovers uh, who are, or you know, adult children who live with us, all sorts of membership issues. We might bring a proposal to the full circle and say, we're thinking of making this decision. Tell us what you think. We gather that input go away and we make the decision back in, in our work circle, in the membership circle. So feedback is a really critical thing that you can do in full circle. Learning, uh, learning about everything. So learning about sociocracy, learning about nonviolent communication, learning about the public politics of your town, learning about the quality of the soils, you know, and what you can grow there best, um, all sorts of things that you could, you could spend time learning and connection and that's the heart of why you would get together is about connection so what we often do is we'll break up into small groups and share some aspect of life story you know what was what was your life like when you were in high school uh, what's the story of your life told from a gender perspective or a race perspective or class perspective you know so different ways of sharing you know embarrassing moments of your life whatever it is things that bring us into telling stories to each other so how do we get from communities that are run by consensus to, um, 
to sociocracy. This is what you came here for. Um, so we have a community and there's, a, there's this question you might have about your governance and your decision making. Is it working for us? And so that might lead to uh, gathering some information, like what other ways of making decisions or governance are there? Uh, so a few people who might be interested might start sharing some materials, gathering some information, um, you know, starting a, having a little group that starts looking at the alternatives. And that might lead to a study group on sociocracy. That's the way it worked in our community. Uh, I had already, I was already teaching sociocracy, but it was not necessarily immediately welcome in my community. Uh, and what happened was that uh, there was a, yet another retreat in which in our community said, uh, yeah, our governance system isn't working very well. Uh, and we'd had that same conversation a number of times before. Um, and this time, like we'd done a number of times before, we created a task group to think about governance. Um, and unlike times before, this task group did not fade away. This task group actually stuck. Um, in part because several people went to a workshop that myself and John Buck uh, were teaching at another community uh, with a lot of other co-housing folks and they got convinced. So when they came back from that conference, um, we met as a small group uh, and we proceeded to teach ourselves sociocracy, teach ourselves the decision-making process, play around with designs, those circles, you know, we played around with little pieces of paper trying to figure out how to best design that, that, you know, a structure that would work. And as we learned, we shared information with the community. So we shared more materials. Um, and as we learned, we, we, we put together a proposal for the community uh, about how we could adopt sociocracy. Uh, we went through a number of revisions about that. Uh, we, uh, we presented to the community, we had an objection, we had a, a mediate, you know, we had a, another task group to try to deal with the objectors and the proposers. That even failed. We had a mediation, that failed. Um, then we had an outside visitor, which is another interesting thing. Diana Leaf Christian came through and did an evening uh, with the community and that helped move some of the folks. Uh, and we were able then to have a meeting at which we adopted sociocracy. Um, so lots of sharing materials, information with others along the way. You know, we pushed the button. Uh, we had our launch meeting where, uh, after we had adopted sociocracy, where we um, chose our leaders of our four working groups, four core working groups, and um, and then what had been the study group that became the implementation circle then also became kind of the governance support circle. So after adoption, there's also the question of how do you sustain what you have adopted? And so that small group uh, with some changes in personnel um, then was there to help support the ongoing learning, continuing learning uh, of sociocracy. And so, as you go through the process of trying to bring sociocracy to a group, there's going to be questions like power issues. Can we trust the circles? They're gonna make a decision that I don't like. Or what will happen to my input? Will I be, li be listened to or will they just, you know, just disregard what I have to say? So those are all serious questions. They need to be listened to, reflected back. I hear what you're saying and really taking that seriously of trying to understand how, what are they bringing up? How does this system relate to what their issues are? Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fear of change, you know, the inertia towards change and fear of the changing power relations. As I said earlier, you know, those dissatisfied individuals who were always dissatisfied before in consensus there's some of the folks that might really object to the transition to sociocracy because they're afraid their voice will get diminished. And it's true, their voice would get diminished. <laughs> uh, and that's part of the intent because we wanna have more of a balance be between the individual and the group. Those dissatisfied individuals, if they're gonna be in governance, they're gonna be in a small group. 
dealing with the common house or dealing with buildings and grounds. And they're going to have to deal with their peers as working peers, not simply dropping their ideas anonymously into the large group. So another thing I say about how we think about the shift from consensus to sociocracy is if you want to make it happen, you have to think like an organizer. So who are the people who are the supporters? Who are the people who like, yeah, I, I, I like sociocracy. That seems like a, like a good idea. So you want to build them, help them, support them to become enthusiastic leaders, not just supporters. And you want to take the people as like, well, you know, the, the lawn is getting mowed, the, the meals are made. So I don't see why, you know, we need to do a big shift in governance. I mean, it's working okay. Um, moving them towards, oh, okay, well, maybe things actually could be better. And maybe these people who are enthusiastic, uh, it's worth giving them a shot at doing something that makes it better. So moving the kind of neutral people to positive, and then the people who are uh, start off as, as negative or critical, how can we move them to a place, to a neutral place, at least to a place as well, I'm willing to try this. I'm willing to let this happen and see what happens. Everyone needs to be trained. <laughs> everyone needs to learn. This is, you know, this is culture change. So we do need to have everyone to, in order to, to launch uh, the transition and also to sustain it. And, you know, that's what we do at Sociocracy for All. We have a lot of training programs, a lot of variations of things. The simplest thing we have is this uh, the 18 or 20 minute introductory animated video. Anybody can watch it. It's kind of fun. You know, it's animated, it's kind of fun. So you can get people to say, hey, will you watch this little thing with me and talk about it? So you, you can just sort of talk one-on-one -on -one with people or do it in a small group. So don't think you have to change the entire community all at once. Think like an organizer, you're kind of picking off people and, and getting them on based upon your relationship with them to be open and to sit with you and watch a video like this. And then that person can bring in the next person because somebody else trusts that person. They may not trust you as much. So it's building that network of, of trust among people with relationships to each other. Very popular, uh, well, two, two uh, next level trainings that we have is the, the six hour, um, three two-hour sessions introduction to sociocracy. It's kind of a basic straightforward introduction. Uh, if you can get some folks to do that, they'll have a better understanding. The really popular thing that we uh, do in, um, in co-housing communities in particular is our empowered learning circle. So it's our group, it's uh, four two-hour sessions where there's a video that's set up. You, you, you do it on your own time. I don't have to be there or Ted, no trainer needs to be present. You just follow some instructions based upon a curriculum. You, you, in a sense, you go through the process yourself, including selections within your small group. So you can select your facilitator and so on. And you experience the selection process and you experience decision-making on various different pieces that we offer you and you go through the steps. And um, by the time people are finished that set, they are usually fairly enthusiastic and go, ooh, I like this, you know, and then you've got a, a set of people who are believers who can then spread the word and maybe can generate a second study group or a third study group. There are some communities that really send everybody through this, which of course, from my perspective, I'm biased, I would love because that means you have a much wider base of people who understand. And we also have other online classes now, again, another three hour, I mean, two, three session, two hours each of facilitation. Uh, so we teach all the, you know, the, the skills of facilitation and hardly recommend that to the, particularly the folks who want to take some of those roles on in your community. But of course, facilitation training is great for everyone, even if you're not the facilitator, because now you know how to support your facilitator. Um, and then, you know, completing the cycle is just, uh, you know, how do you, how do you sustain? Once you've adopted sociocracy, you need to have an onboarding process for your new members. 
because there'll be transitions, right? And there'll be people moving in and out. Um, so all those folks should be getting an orientation to sociocracy, just as they should be getting an orientation to any of your other practices or, you know, the history or the, some of the culture or whatever it is that you want to orient people to about your community. And go to sociocracyforall.org. That's our website. Lots of materials there. Um, slash community, you'll find information about, particularly about co-housing communities. That other uh, link, the ELK, Empowered Learning Circles, ELC, that's that particular program. Um, and there's always the book, which I don't know that I have any copy near me here. Um, if you haven't seen this, well, I'll stop share, and then I can share that. Yeah, Many Voices, One Song. Um, single copies you can get through any online retailer, Amazon or your favorite alternative. And if you want to order books in bulk, six copies or more, we'll ship them out to you for half price for some and some shipping. So that's the other little ad, but it's a, it's a manual that's really, there's a ton of how to in here. So it's really, really supportive. Um, that is everything that I want to say. So having said all that, I'm just going to throw you back into small groups. I'll say a few things, um, but um, some of you might also reflect on what have you tried or what are your challenges around this particular issue. The, um, the, there's a couple of things I guess I would start saying. One is uh, always trying to maintain the sense of, of respect and care about the other person, no matter how unreasonable sometimes you think they might be. Uh, you know, you do the best that you can to listen to them, particularly reflect back to them what you're hearing them say as, as what's important. Um, the more you listen to them, the more likely it is that they may be able to turn around and listen to you. Um, so um, it's, it's um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of another phrase that I like from, from my past of, uh, it's really hard to change the mind of someone who thinks you do not respect them. So if that's the attitude, because you know sociocracy, you know, is the just, you know, the best thing, and this idiot isn't coming along, and you convey that kind of attitude to them, well, it's a perfectly good reason for them not to want it. Um, so that just confirms that sociocracy isn't the bee's knees if they're going to be treated like that. Um, the other couple of things that I would say is, um, is the, you know, having a sense of experiment, experiment, you know, this is an experiment. Uh, let's try it. Let's try it for a short amount of time. Let's, let's take the things that you are concerned about and make them things that we use in our evaluation. So what are you worried about? Are you worried about um, that people won't really be heard because decisions are being made in small groups? Okay, let's, let's, let's ask that. You know, let's try this for six months and then ask that question of people. How is it, how, is, how, is it, how have you experienced that? So whatever their particular fears or concerns, turn them into things that you could measure in an evaluation process. Um, and um, from that, you can always improve. Uh, and from that experience, they may relax. Um, our, our three objectors, when we were doing it, one of them actually intentionally did not come to the meeting. That way they didn't have to object, <laughs> knowing that the other 50 something people really wanted this to happen. Um, and the other two uh, in consensus practice stood aside. Uh, and then we worked really hard, uh, at least with one of them, to bring them into a working circle, and they were a productive working member of that circle, and, and I think basically they wind up enjoying that experience, and it didn't turn out to be, uh, the change to sociocracy didn't turn out to be as dramatic as some people thought it would be, uh, except it did change the nature of how we spend time in our full circle, in our whole community meetings. Um, which most people really appreciated because now we had more time to connect with each other. 
And we do that now with COVID, we're not meeting in person anymore, but we can do Zoom meetings like this and we can do what we just did, do breakout rooms. And then people, you know, random, uh, get to talk to other members of the community who maybe they haven't talked to in a long time. Uh, any, let's see, uh, there were so many hands up on this particular question. So let me first hear if there's any particular tips, things that you think you've learned from your hard won experience around dealing with this. Anybody want to share anything that you have experienced that's been helpful in dealing with opposition from a few? Neil? You're mute. I think one of the things, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I uh, have been um, working uh, with a small group of um, neighbors, villagers, uh, several of whom are, are here right now. And uh, the one thing, I, uh, first thing I want to do is thank you. Uh, we've really um, made, I think, really good use of your materials. And, and we've learned a lot. Uh, so much of what you're talking about today is already familiar to us, and, and that's a good sign. Um, I think that uh, several things that, that, uh, that I've learned from this process is that it's really important to be patient. You know, we have, you know you're gonna have a lot of resistance. Um, so be patient. Um, uh, I think that, that, that ultimately we we, we decided that there are um, four or five things that we wanted to achieve. And this was uh, after we did a community survey. So asking people in the community how they feel about governance is a good way to start. And it became clear to us that we would benefit from more trust, more transparency, more engagement. Um, and, and those are important things. Uh, and, and, and relationships that were more egalitarian. So rather than just, you know, just going full speed ahead, we were maybe slightly devious and, and several of us became or were already facilitators and we introduced rounds to the meetings without making this um, mm -hmm. um, uh, difficult for people who might resist. So, and I think one of the things we've learned is that small changes can pay big dividends. So if folks keep that in mind, you know, introduce change slowly. If, if people aren't embracing uh, sociocracy, you can still introduce changes. People will be happier. And then I think more comfortable with, uh, with the idea of change. Um, uh, we need to think of our community as an evolving community rather than as a mature or established community, which it also is, but we need to be evolving and open to change. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Small steps start start with just with you know doing around, and then people experience the difference that that makes. Right. Uh, it's interesting that you know we just had a call from another co-housing community in formation, and it might have been Skagit. I don't remember which one it was, but said somebody in our community did the research and said sociocracy is the way to go, and so that's so we just adopted it, and we just don't know that much about it. <laughs> which is very different from some of the existing communities who've been around for years and it's so hard to make a change. So it is much harder to make a change in an existing community than, to, than in a startup. Um, and there was a question in the chat, which was uh, circle membership. And you can, you can put more questions in the chat so we can keep going through that. Um, are, is circle membership rigid or can people hop around? So what I say to that is that um, circles need to have defined membership. You need to know who your members are. Um, and it's not a drop in, drop out. You don't just show up at a group and know just because you showed up that day, uh, you now get to be a decider. But they are circles and also should be open. So they're open to new members and there's criteria for new members like you will show up regularly. You'll do some of the work. You're not just here as a talking head, but as a contributor in the group. So circle membership from a sociocratic point of view uh, should be in a sense uh, um, defined, but open, if, if that makes sense what I'm saying there. And I saw a hand, but I don't remember who it was. Um, Kirsten. Yes, Kirsten. I see. Just related to that, that past, uh, the past discussion about resistance and change to soci sociocracy, I really, 
we're just maybe considering, a few of us are considering going this direction, but I think um, we always want to keep in mind that the people who've joined co-housing with a consensus model really feel like they have entered a contract with their neighbors. And to do something else for a lot of people feels like a break of that contract. So I like the comment about patience. Um, and I think we have to be really careful with sort of, with trickery, like you want to introduce something, but you want to be upfront, I think, because um, it is a change in the contract. Mm -hmm. And I think speaking to people's fears about what will they lose. Um, and I think giving it time, they start to see maybe it's not such a break. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm curious to hear, it's really neat to hear that established communities can shift. That's really neat. Oh, it was something you said I wanted to speak to. Um, well, we lost it. So we'll go on. Um, and is there another question here? Oh, how do circles make decisions? Well, uh, oh, now I remember what it was. So yeah, circles make decisions by consent. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we didn't really talk about the difference between consensus and consent. Um, so maybe that's something to touch on for some of you. So I think of basically, you know, consent is really a uh, just a particular approach to consensus. Just like in majority rule, there's different kinds of majority rule. There's supermajority, there's, you know, 51%. There is... Um, ranked choice voting, you know, there are different ways to do majority rule. They're all still on some levels, majority rule. So there are variations on how to do consensus. You know, you can sit in a meeting and sit silently until you all come to the same place. You can do way of counsel and just, you know, go round and round and round until you all get to the same, you know, to a place of, of uh, sense of the meaning of the whole, that you're, you're there somewhere. Um, so to me, consent is a form of consensus. It just happens to be a fairly structured one, fairly defined, which is one of the things that I like. Um, and it, it puts a primacy on things that we intend by consensus, but don't always achieve. And that is, um, you know, every voice matters which is the biggest issue for me about the way we typically practice consensus, particularly in large groups, that, you know, we don't hear from everybody. And some people speak loudly and often, and we hear from them a lot. Um, and then people who are afraid, more shy, or don't speak up in large groups, or don't want to speak up in a large group and have somebody, you know, jump at them for what they said, they won't speak up. So the distribution from whole group decision making to smaller group decision making really empowers voices more. So it is more, in a sense, to me, more consensus than what we often practice as consensus. Uh, because more people's voices are really being heard, um, given space for. One of the beauties of doing rounds, not only does everyone get a turn to speak, but when it's your turn to speak, you know that you have at least those few moments of your turn that nobody's going to interrupt you. Whereas in whole group consensus or even in, in popcorn style small group, if you pause just as long as I just paused right now, somebody else might have jumped in and I might not have been finished with my thought. Um, let's see, is there more to say about the differences between consensus and consent? Well, we typically uh, just say that um, there's a tendency in consensus, not everybody does it this way, but the question is, so do we all agree? Whereas it's very clear under consent decision-making that the question is, are there any objections? And the intent there is that it's in a sense, it's a lower bar than do we all agree. It's, it's, it should be easier to make a decision. Like, well, this isn't my, it's, it's the whole thing about the difference between a preference and what I'm willing to work with. You know? Um, I, I uh, you know, if I might've had a preference uh, for Bernie Sanders, uh, if I could vote for him in the election, um, 
that would have been my preference, but I can live with, at least at this moment, in voting for Biden. You know, so the difference between a preference and what I can work with. And if you go with what you can work with, the scope of what's possible is much larger than if you stick to your preference. You know. Um, so preference versus um, sort of the range of tolerance of what, what can you go with. And the other piece that I think is really important, and this is often in consensus as well, but I think it's really critical to the success of consent decision making, and that is feedback. Is the whole process of every meeting ends with a round of feedback of how did this meeting go? You know, yeah, it was, yeah, I loved it. You know, we got a lot of stuff done. You know, I felt really heard. You know, that's the, 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 uh, the son in this family reported that um, he liked the meeting because his opinions were heard. And he may not have had as much of expectation that that would actually happen. <laughs> so um, evaluations gives us a chance to improve. So we can, we can um, make policy and say, okay, we're going to revisit this policy in three months if we're kind of worried about it. And if we're really confident, we'll say, well, we'll revisit this policy in five years. Um, but you always revisit it sometime so that it stays fresh and doesn't become, you know, like those, some of those strange laws in the United States where slavery is still, you know, legal in some states because, you know, they never actually took it off the books. Um, is there more to say? Um, feedback, uh, feedback for your facilitator, for your, for your members of your group. You know, what specifically did the, what specifically did the facilitator do that really helped in this meeting? You know, I appreciated facilitator when, when you redirected someone who, you know, had broken the round and said, you know, hold on, we're, we're still doing the round and this person's next. Or when you affirmed somebody and said, you know, yes, this point that you're making is uh, is a really significant point. Let's put it in our backlog for other things to talk about in future meetings. Uh, and let's get back to the issue that we're currently talking about. So appreciate and acknowledge the things that your facilitator does that supports, you know, every voice uh, being heard, every voice mattering. We also do sometimes, uh, particularly in our training programs, but we encourage everybody to do it in circles, to just do a round and have simply every person in the circle say, what are the strengths and challenges that I bring to working in groups? So I can say for myself, you know, well, I can synthesize well, I'm a, I'm a good proposal writer, uh, I can facilitate pretty well, and I can get impatient. Uh, yeah, when things aren't going my way, it's like, Arr! you can, you know, so that's what I need to watch out for myself. Okay. Now, when I do get impatient at a meeting, somebody can say, Jerry, you're doing that. And it's like, okay, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be behaving in this way because I know it's not effective. It doesn't help the group for me to act impatient, no matter how right I might be. So I can, you know, relax a little bit. But if I don't self-volunteer my strengths and challenges, then it's harder for people to be my ally because they have to get over the hump of like, oh, I want to say something critical of Jerry. How's he going to take it? Is he going to hurt his feelings? Do I have the courage to speak up because maybe he'll criticize me in return? You know, like, so if we can get past that, uh, if we can get past that fear of feedback, then the world opens to us because we can learn and grow. Um, and we in co-housing communities, a lot of us have a tendency to uh, uh, avoid conflict, which means we perpetuate the conflict. We enable the conflict, we let it sit there and go on and on and on. Okay, what else do we wanna talk about? Yeah, somebody quoted the, uh, the terms, uh, Safe enough to try, good enough for now. Um, yeah. uh, if, if it appears to be more evolving than fixed. Yeah, yes, that's the intent of sociocracy. It's a, that's why it's called sometimes dynamic governance, meaning things change. Things are not set in stone. If we figure out something better tomorrow, I mean, I'm ready to drop sociocracy tomorrow if somebody could show me a better way. So I'll keep promoting sociocracy until I've got something better. That's why I promoted consensus before, because it was a heck of a lot better than majority rule. 
where there were so many losers. You know, can't tell you how many elections I voted for a loser. What else do we have? So, okay. Other comments or questions? What do you want to bring up? Jennifer. Yeah, I wanted to ask you um, to talk a little bit about how your training in nonviolent communication has helped you with governance. Yes, okay. How has it helped me? Um, multiple ways. So one is the continual recognition that people who disagree with me are not my enemies. They are simply responding to what they see, you know, to their best strategies to meet what they perceive as their needs. And we all have the same universal needs. So um, I know that, you know, this person across the room from me, uh, across, actually, we did have, a, have some meetings out um, in an outside area, so I could actually see the person face to face, kind of, uh, that their disagreement about how we open or not our common house uh, under these COVID situation uh, it's not because they're stupid or wrong or because, you know, they're my enemy. It's because they see their, their need for safety uh, and community well-being is my need. We just have different strategies about it. So that helps me lighten up. That's, that's our first thing is, you know, continually kind of correcting my own attitude when I start getting impatient, as I said before. It's like, okay, breathe. Um, and... How can I reflect back? So another piece is a facilitator, reflecting back what I think I'm hearing. So let me see if I've heard you. Uh, you're taking this position, you know, you're objecting perhaps to this proposal um, for these reasons. Um, did I understand what, what you were intending to say? So that's important because it's easy for me to go to my exaggeration of their position, for example. <laughs> um, so, uh, making sure message sent was message received is a key part. Um, the even opening and closing rounds, you know, how am I showing up at the meeting? How am I feeling at, as I enter the meeting? Am I acknowledging that I'm feeling tense about the particular topic or that I'm feeling tired? Um, and, um, you know, so whatever, whatever energy that I'm coming in, I'm sharing some of that. And we're, we're getting used to sharing that because many of us have been through nonviolent communication. So in general, anything that's difficult, nonviolent communication supports making it a little bit easier. And we've had, we've had some practice group or another about nonviolent communication since almost our earliest days. We probably have 20 years of at least one study group ongoing uh, doing that. And we've also done some other things. We've, we've experimented with Byron Katie's The Work, and a lot of people found a lot of benefit from that. Um, there, there is, you know, there's a group that meditates regularly on Sunday mornings, uh, you know, so mindfulness. Uh, we've done some teaching about that in the whole group meeting. So anything that creates more space for people to slow down, self-reflect, uh, recognize everybody else in the community as you know, our loving companions, even if we're not always on the same path in the community. Joyce, and then Gabriela. Um, I wrote this in the chat. So. Uh, I think it got missed. So there are many decisions that affect everyone in the community, perhaps even more in a developing community like ours. Could you please talk more about both how to get full input from the whole community when a decision is to be made in a circle that affects everyone and also how to establish the trust that is necessary for the whole group to trust that the circle will make a decision that considers everyone's needs and desires. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So I have my, my classic story. If anybody's ever listened to me before, you've heard this one before. Uh, outdoor cats. <laughs> if, you, if you live in a community where outdoor, you know, where there might be outdoor cats, you know that that's one of the toughest issues in co-housing. Because on the one hand, cats are, you know, God's gift to people or to nature, and they belong outside. They belong to do whatever they want to do in the world. On the other hand, cats are bird killers and poop in sandboxes and all that other stuff. So, you know, they're very diametrically opposed opinions about the role of cats in our communities, outdoor cats. Um, we, that, I would say that that was our bloodiest issue in our first 18 years of existence. At one point we had 10 outdoor cats and the people who were upset about the number of cats and what they were doing um, were just exhausted and furious, etc. cetera. Um, I, could, I could not let my kids play in the sandbox, for example, because it was full of cat poop and I got tired of scooping it up. And I got tired of calling the cat owners to say, will you please come clean out your cat's poop? And, you know, we tried putting covers on all that. So anyway, that was, you know, I had my own bias around that issue, just to acknowledge that. When we adopted sociocracy, um, our group, Community Life, our circle, tried to uh, address the issue of, of outdoor cats. So we, um, we did a survey, trying to understand what people's opinions were about cats and how many could be tolerated, et cetera, on what basis. We talked to individuals, we talked to that bird lover who had planted everything around his house to attract birds, only to attract the cats to kill the birds. We talked to the cat lovers. Um, so we got you know the direct opinions of the people who were most passionate on either end. Um, so we did the survey, we talked to individuals, we wrote up, you know, we did some research, we wrote up a, a, a policy, you know, we kind of revised the existing policy. Uh, we came to, uh, you know, temporary provisional consent within our own circle. And then we brought it to the full circle. And we said, we're thinking of making this decision. Give us your feedback. And we heard from that group. Um, and you know, one of the things that we heard was, well, what about if a new family comes into the community and we've, we've created this cap on the number of outdoor cats we can have in the community? So that means if we already have five outdoor cats and there's this new, new family that wants to come in and we really want them to come in, but they have outdoor cats, does that mean we're going to say no to them? Like, oh, well, we hadn't thought about that. Okay, so that was good input and we created a, okay, the new family can come in and then we'll just wait, you know, we'll, you know, that over, over time, the number of cats will drop down again um, to, to the five max or four max that we had set. Um, so that's, in a sense, that's what I want to say is the process is just feedback in different ways. And what I, you know, the, my punchline around this is most people in the community did not like the policy that we made. But most people in the community liked that we had a policy. And it, it stopped it stopped the fights. The reason most people didn't like it is because, you know, we had a bunch of people who wanted cats and a bunch of people who didn't want cats. So it was like a what's that those bimodal curves? So there's a lot of people who would have wanted less cats so wanted people who wanted more cats. Um, and we set, you know, we did something in the middle. Um, and we have not had a single conversation about outdoor cats since then. And it's been about eight years. Um, so to me, that's kind of the, you know, the, the, the sort of the classic example of, you know, what do you do uh, with things that affect everyone? Now, some of you are in situations where you're forming and you're talking about finances. Um, and um, again, you know, yes, you're going to have a larger group perhaps that needs to be making some of these decisions. Um, you, you're going to need your whole group or, or at least the whole group that's, that has invested money to be part of the group that decides the location, you know, whether you want this area or that area. 
So there is, there is a need for larger group decision making uh, in the early stages of co-housing when you need everybody united uh, on, on some of those directions. How do you do that? Um, is again, you know, to me is always try to break it up into, you know, you have a, if you have a whole group meeting, then you break it up into small groups so that everybody can have a better chance to talk and explore. And then you can have uh, delegates from those small groups meet in a fishbowl in the middle and they talk to each other based upon what they heard in their small groups and talk to each other. So um, transparency is critical. Um, what we gained from doing the outdoor cat policy in our community was that people trusted the process that we went through. They saw that it was honorable. It wasn't, it wasn't a secret backroom deal. Jerry didn't get his particular way, etc. cetera. Um, so you, you need to earn the trust. I know there's people here, but there was one community where, where there was a trust issue that came right up. Uh, as soon as the community had adopted sociocracy, one of the one of the small groups uh, made a change in the use of one of the rooms, and that brought up issues of of trust. It's like, wait a minute, you can do that? You can just do that? Well, if that's if that's sociocracy, I'm not so sure I want it. And what was the problem? The problem is that that group had not sought feedback. They didn't say, "We're thinking of doing this for these reasons. Tell us what you think and get some feedback." And if they had done that, they would either have changed their minds or they might have been able to go ahead with that change with more support from the community. So, what else do we have? You want to know what the cap policy is? It's, it's, a, it's a little long, but it's basically a, a cap on, I think it's either four or five outdoor cats. And you actually have to have pictures of them and they get posted so that people can identify which cat is which, especially if the cats do things that people don't like. Uh, so there's accountability, you know, for the cat owners to, to be responsible for things that their cats do. Um, and what is enforcement? This is an interesting issue, you know, like enforcement of cat policy or any other policy. Enforcement in co-housing is really about peer culture. Uh, you know, you're not going to you're not going to evict somebody from co-housing. It would take you so many thousands of dollars to get rid of somebody who owns a unit that it's just usually not practical. Um, so, how do you lovingly talk to each other? The best example I have of that from my own community is um, for many years there was kind of like a you know kind of a resentment about people who didn't pull their weight, people who didn't do as, you know, as much work as some of the other folks, the slackers, and there was you know, yeah, resentment about those folks. It became clear, at least to me after a while, that we were losing more energy in the resentment than we were losing in those people not doing work. And that was an interesting lesson for me. <laughs> It's kind of like, all right, you know, like instead of always yelling at my kids to pick up their socks, maybe I just pick up the socks on the floor and it's done. And I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> it's just done. So what we did after sociocracy, we, we uh, had this, the, the work hub who was in charge of kind of distributing the work, finding people to do different things, et cetera. And rather than in a sense going for public shaming, which usually doesn't work very well, they would go individually to um, to an individual or a family and say, you know, as far as we can tell, you know, you're not you're not you're not doing kind of the typical six and a half hours or more that people do. Um, maybe there's maybe we don't really fully know what you're doing. We'd love to hear how you're thinking about your work in the community. And these are some of the needs that we have in the community. Is there something here that speaks to you that uh, you might be feel more drawn to? And then people could respond to what, you know, to the requests rather than a generalized shame process. It was a more particular one on one relationship asking people, um, you know, is there some way that meets your interests that you could contribute to the community. It was a different process, much more positive oriented, and that got a lot more um, 
more meeting the policy than we had before. Um, there was another, you know, so I think most of this is, is around, you know, the peer relations. We do have a care and counsel group that mostly acts in a, it acts reactively to issues that come up in the community. Uh, so they, you know, people there, people are welcome to go to them for help in mediation, mediating conflicts or just being listened to about something that's going on. We did create a new policy called um, the resolution group. And that is uh, for when we are not able to mediate our way to resolution, then we have this other group that is um, the people who are members of this group are selected. Um, the first couple of people are selected by community life circle. And then those people select can, can select a couple more to help them out. Um, that group of and those people have they are they're vetted by who, whoever the parties in conflict might be that you know yes we could work with these people um and they basically act like a like a jury i mean and judge or judge they they listen to the facts of the case and they make a determination and whatever they say um you know is the policy that needs to happen so we that that came up that arose out of um a new dog that was brought into the community that was rather rambunctious and um, kind of jumped at people, uh, actually nipped somebody, uh, a kid in the, you know, nipped them at the face. So there was a lot of concern about the safety uh, of people uh, and a concern that the family wasn't dealing uh, appropriately enough with their dog. Uh, and so the resolution group met and they made a decision. You know, he, you know the dog can stay if, you follow these protocols, including, you know, dog training, et cetera. Um, and the family did that. They followed the protocols. The dog is still here and is much more well-behaved now. Um, so sometimes we talk about the graduated series of consequences. You know, um, always, always talk one-on-one -on -one first. Uh, I used to have a, I used to have semi-regular conflicts with somebody back when we did consensus. And if we, if I got mad at the meeting, then I would say to him afterwards, hey, can we take a walk? So we could do some repair of, you know, what had happened. So, you know, you start off with a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversations with people and you move on from there to a group, uh, you know, group context or uh, restorative circles is another practice that we use coming out of nonviolent communication. We've used something we um, only used it once, but call it eldering coming from the kind of the Quaker tradition of someone who was flagrantly violating uh, a policy. Um, our circle sent two well-respected people in the community to go talk to that family and say, hey, this isn't working. And we listened to why they weren't doing it. And we told them the effect that they were having on the community. And, um, and you know, they kind of understood. They were angry, but once they were heard and once they heard the impact of their behavior on others, they kind of understood that what they were doing was not actually helpful. It was going to isolate them more than they were already. Um, so let's see, we're running out of time here. Uh, somebody else has got, uh, Gabriella, you had your hand up, yes, before. Maybe this might be, we're getting to maybe to the last question or I'm, I'm willing to stay here for a little bit longer after our appointed hour and a half. So if anybody wants to stick around and talk a little bit more, I'm happy to do that. But I also want to release you momentarily. Gabriella, last question. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I, you actually uh, keep on kind of slowly responding uh, to my question. It, it was more, the question is about the people who have less tolerance than the others. And I had a particular Example, which was happening in one of our meetings, um, but I'm not sure if it's a good time to share it now or whether I should take it maybe um, before, uh, later, later on. Yeah, actually, maybe we should just say let's take it later on, um, since we're we're sort of taking our time, and I know people are going to start leaving. I'm going to ask any of you to. Um, one of our little practices doing these sessions is since it's too long to everybody to say goodbye or everything they got out of this, if you would write in the chat, what's one thing you're taking away? What's a nugget of wisdom or like, oh, this was cool. I liked hearing this or 
what was your leftover question that we didn't get around to that you're still troubled by or wondering about? So fill up the chat with any of those kinds of thoughts. Uh, that'll give me some feedback <laughs> on what was useful and meaningful to you in this session and uh, what kind of things still were left unanswered. So I'll let you do that for, for a minute and then I'll just invite, uh, yeah, I'll just do that for 30 seconds. <laughs> and then I'll just invite maybe two or three people to say something out loud so we get a sense of closure verbally from, and then 